right, well, we are at 12 o'clock, so I might get started with uh, a little bit in the way of introductions and housekeeping notes, and then Taylor, I'll let you run with it, and we'll go through your presentation and then move to Q&A towards the end. Um, folks, if you have any questions, please enter them either in the chat function or in the Q&A. You'll find both of those if you mouse towards the bottom of the Zoom window, Q&A will have a little bubble and uh, chat will be labeled as well. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I miss seeing everyone in person at our Lunch and Learn sessions that we hold throughout the year, but I'm so glad that you could join us from wherever you are and hope that everyone's keeping healthy and well. Uh, my name is Taryn and I'm the Operations and Communications Coordinator with SVP Waterloo Region. We're your hosts for today, along with BDO Canada, who's our workshop series sponsor. SVP Waterloo Region is a registered charity and we work with a network of local charities and engaged community members who are our partners and they invest their time, donations and professional skills into projects that are managed by SVP. Through these projects, we get to help local charities build their capacity and by working alongside them for up to three years, we get to see some of the long-term impacts of this work. We also get to support the broader charitable sector with programs like Perfect Pitch, SVP Teens and workshops like this one. A couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, if you have questions for our presenter, Taylor, as I mentioned earlier, please enter them into the Q&A function below, and I'll do my best to get to all of them during that part of the call. If you have any technical challenges, drop off, or have any questions afterwards, please contact me, and I can be reached at info at svpwr.org. I will be recording this session, and we'll be sharing it with the slides later next week. Uh, so you can share those with someone that might find them handy if you like or refer to them later. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce our workshop speaker, Taylor Walker. She's an experienced HR professional who got, uh, spent much of her career in Waterloo Region's tech sector. She started in talent acquisition, successfully building recruitment programs at two different startups before moving to a business partner role at Avic Networks. Now, she focuses on employee programs, enhancing employee experience, and is the go-to HR person for employees and leaders at Avic Worldwide. I'm also super proud to note that she is one of our SVP partners. Thank you for joining us today, Taylor, and over to you. Thank you, Taryn. That was a lovely introduction. <laughs> Awesome. Okay. Well, welcome, everybody. I'm hoping that we don't have too many tech challenges here. I was just telling Taryn, I haven't used the webinar function on Zoom too much. So hopefully we'll, we'll kind of get through it and, uh, and we can have some good um, uh, kind of Q&A at the end. Um, I do have quite a bit of content to, to cover today, um, but so I'm going to try not to go too fast, <laughs> um, but Taryn will be sending out my slides um, after the, the, the webinar is over. So there'll be some links and some resources in those as well um, that you can visit um, on your own time to learn a little bit more, go a little bit more in depth. So as Taryn mentioned, we're going to be talking about employee engagement today, which is a, um, you know, a hot button topic lately, uh, especially given kind of the way the world has gone in the last eight, nine months or so, however long into this we are now. Um, so I'm going to be talking about um, a lot of things to, around employee engagement. It's a very big topic. Um, so we're just going to touch on some of the kind of basics of it today and then um you know maybe we can as uh, tara and i were chatting earlier maybe we can kind of go a little bit more in depth in the future with a different another session also um i will provide my contact information at the end as well so if anyone has specific questions or you know ha wants to you know, book a call or anything like that i am totally open to that as well so um as Taryn said please um make sure you're you're documenting your questions as they come up in that q a function and we will make sure we get to um as many as we can at the the end. All right. So a little bit about me. Um, I, as Taryn mentioned, I am an HR business partner at Avic Networks in Waterloo. I've been with Avic for about uh, just over three years now. Um, I started in uh, talent acquisition, built out, the, built out the talent acquisition program um, at Avic and then moved into the business partner function um, two years ago, a year and a half 
ish <laughs> at this point uh, at this point so um now i always think that you know someone's resume is definitely the the um least interesting thing about them so i included some other stuff about me as well um i am a tech community enthusiast i'm not a hugely technical person but i'm very passionate about the tech community we have in waterloo region i have worked in the, in tech uh for over five years um, and really kind of built a great network and uh, and great kind of friendships in the tech community. And I just think it's such a supportive and great thing we have going on in the region. I'm also an SVP partner. Um, I'm going into my second year as an SVP partner. Um, I've worked on a whole bunch of different projects with Taryn and uh, Rose and, and other partners as well. I got to sit on the investment committee this year, which was a super cool process um, and looking forward to doing that again uh, next year if I can. So um, yes, so SVP has opened up a lot of um, interesting uh, opportunities and um, given me insight into a whole you know, other part of of other sector of our region that we have uh, here in Waterloo. I'm also a foodie when, you know, we're not in the middle of a global pandemic. I love to entertain, I love to feed people, and I love to cook. Um, so I'm still cooking a lot, but you know, I'm just feeding a smaller group of people now. I'm also a mom uh, to my son, Henry. He is two, you can see him and my husband in the picture there. And I am expecting our second in May. So very exciting. Um, obviously being a mom is a big part of my life as well. So I thought I would introduce that too. All right, so let's get into it here. Um, just a little bit of an agenda of the um, topics we'll be covering today. We're going to work, uh, we start with defining employee engagement, really what it looks like, what we're talking about when we talk about employee engagement, um, why it's important, and things like that. We'll also be talking about burnout. Um, that is a huge topic, kind of a buzzword. You'll notice that there's going to be quite a few HR buzzwords as we go through, but um, you know, I try not to be too HR-y about these things, but some of the, the words are important. Um, so we'll, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about burnout, how you identify it, and what you do about it. Um, also, we're going to talk about the importance of an engaged workforce. So really, you know, why are we talking about this? Why do we care? We're going to talk about measuring employee engagement because that can often be a very intimidating and daunting thing and it really doesn't need to be and getting started with engagement so what do you do now that you now that you're interested in this and now that you think it's important or you want to have it as a focus in your organization uh what do you do next so we're going to go through some some simple steps there and as i mentioned before i'm going to kind of scratch the surface on a bunch of these topics but there's lots more that can be said so i'm going to be providing a bunch of resources at the end for you to to look into if you so choose all right so Defining employee engagement. So really, what, what are we talking about when we talk about employee engagement? To put it simply, um, employee engagement is the emotional commitment that employee an employee has to an organization and its goals and their work. So, um, you know, the, we want employees to, this is employees that care about their work, care about the company, and are connected with the company's mission. That's what an engaged employee looks like. They do what's necessary to get the job done without being asked. They use discretionary effort. That's kind of another buzz term. Discretionary effort is going above and beyond, um, not just doing the bare minimum um, and doing going above and beyond because they want to um, and because they, you know, they feel that connection to the company's mission and they want to drive it forward. Um, engaged employees are much more resilient to change in the workplace. Um, you know, change is something that we deal with. Uh, you know, one of those cheesy cliche sayings is that change is the only constant. Um, and, uh, you know, we want, we need our employees to be um, agile and resilient to that change. So engaged employees are much more resilient that way. Um, engaged employees care about the people they work with. Uh, people are the biggest part of your workplace, uh, whether that's your employees, your customers, your, you know, the, the, the people that your organizations work with. Um, so you want to make sure that all of your employees care about the people that they're working with as well. And employees, this, engaged employees feel emp empowered in their roles. So they feel like they have um, uh, the ability to, uh, to create change and make an impact. Uh, another thing I want to note here too is um, they, that kind of some other key points here is that, you know, engaged employees work hard even when their boss isn't looking. Um, you, they're not looking for the recognition and credit. I mean, recognition credit's always great, but that's not why they're working. So, so they, they're working hard because, again, they connect with the company, they connect with its mission and values. All right, employee engagement is not to be confused with. These are other 
these kind of buzzwordy things that we hear about a lot and they're all different. They're all related to each other, but they are different. So employee satisfaction, sometimes um, employee satisfaction, employee engagement are used interchangeably, but they are different. So a satisfied, a satisfied employee will show up to their nine to five job without complaint, they'll do the work. Um, but that satisfied employee might not go above and beyond. They might not put in the extra effort. Um, and, you know, they might be more likely to be lured away from that job or um, explore other opportunities. Satisfied is not enough. That's kind of the key takeaway there. It shouldn't be confused with employee experience as well. Employee experience is more considered all the encounters and interactions that the employees have with colleagues, leaders, customers, and other people that they work with. So that's more of the actual kind of day-to-day -day stuff is the employee experience. And employee happiness, again, very important. We want happy employees and employee happiness and, and happy employees and engaged employees are do go hand in hand. However, employee happiness is different. So someone might be happy at work, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're working hard, they're do, going above and beyond and they're doing that extra, going that extra mile, doing what's needed to be done without being asked. Um, you know, this is, especially in tech, um, we focus a lot on employee happiness and sometimes our perks like free massages at work or, keg, you know, kegs in the office and things like that, those create happy employees. They don't necessarily create engaged employees. Those things are great, but they're not necessarily what we're talking about today. Again, these are all very important things. They're just different. Okay, some quick facts. Um, I, I like statistics and you know I like some facts, so I, I am gonna share some of those with you as well. So employee engagement really kind of, that term kind of came on the scene um, in the early 90s um, and really kind of started to be considered a key metric in, um, uh, in a lot of organizations since then. Uh, now it's again, something we hear a lot about um, in, you know, not just from HR, but from a, um, you know, an overall, <clears throat> an overall kind of company standpoint, uh, we do hear a lot more about employee engagement than we used to. So there's also, we want to talk about three types of employees in every organization when it comes to engagement. So you got your engaged employees, that's about 15% of your workforce. These are employees that are loyal, emotionally invested, they're right there with the company's mission and values. Um, they're in the roles and they're excelling and they're going above and beyond and they feel that their talents are leveraged um, and they are working to their full potential. About 67% of your workforce considered not engaged. Now, th this isn't bad. Um, these are just employees that are doing, you know, they're doing that nine to five, they're coming in and they're doing the bare minimum, they're doing the job, but they're not necessarily fully bought into the company's mission and values and goals. Um, they're just kind of doing what they're asked and going about their day. Obviously this is the majority, um, just again, based on a, a numbers game here. Then we have a group that we call actively disengaged. This is about 18% of your workforce, which if you notice these numbers here, actively disengaged is a higher percentage than engaged. And that's, you know, that's a problem and that's something we're working to fix. They're consistently negative, create a toxic environment. They can dominate their, their team's culture and um, attitude. And, you know, they can be very toxic to, to their, that uh, team and company culture. And um, they're actually now taking away from employee happiness and taking away from uh, employee engagement. Um, so these numbers are based on a uh, 2017 uh, Gallup State of the Global Workforce place report. Um, I was only able to find US numbers, so I don't know if it's a little bit different in Canada, but that's kind of just to give you a bit of a visual as to what we're working with there with these different types of employees in your workforce. I will note as well, um, not engaged employees are sometimes hard to identify because they are doing the job. They're just not kind of doing, they're not emotionally invested and they're not going above and beyond, so they can kind of float through and see, see through the cracks a little bit. Another point I want to make is employee engagement does not need to be complicated or daunting. Um, it seems like there's a lot of stuff around it, and there is, but we can break it down and, and to simplify it um, and, uh, and really just kind of break it down to find some areas that um, you can work on if you haven't gotten started with employee engagement in your organization. Um, but it's, you know, talking about it and, you know, showing up today is your first step to, to getting started there. So it doesn't need to be a big, scary thing. 
All right, I also want to talk about who owns employee engagement. And really the short answer is everybody. Um, but I want to kind of talk about some more specific roles in employee engagement and, and owning those, especially if you're kind of just getting started uh, with uh, focusing on employee engagement in your in your workforce. So the role of the leader. So that's your, you know, your, your CEO, your executive director, your C-suite, your VPs, that kind of thing. So the high up people that make the decisions, people that drive the company direction. So really they're responsible for, <clears throat> excuse me, defining and communicating a powerful vision for the organization. So before when I was talking about people being bought into that mission and values, the leader's role is to define what that is um, because we can't be bought in if we don't know what it is. So really that's a huge, huge part of the leader's role when it comes to engagement. Leaders' role is also to hire and develop managers and people leaders um, that are invested in the organization's mission and vision as well. So you got to get the right people in leadership roles in order to have um, a successful engaged workforce. So if you really have, you know, the engagement comes from the top down. So people will um, will kind of mirror what they see their leaders uh, doing when it comes to engagement. And they will kind of, you know, emulate that passion as well that they see from the top down. Another key note here is not, I want to say, kind of may put a focus on here is not just hire, but also develop managers. So um, development is also is a huge part of engagement. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that later. But hiring great people is not enough. You also have to keep them moving forward. Another role of the leader here is to um, provide managers with resources to build great teams and get the right people in their roles. Um, so that's, you know, making sure that they're empowered to make hiring decisions, that they know how, proper hiring processes, um, that they know what they're looking for when they're, when they're hiring people um, and, and really defining that and um, pro providing them resources to do so. So really in short, the leader's role is to empower their employees. The leaders are not necessarily doers. They are the guiding force. They are the de defining that mission and values and they're empowering their employees um, and, and, le and uh, people leaders and managers underneath them to push it forward. All right, the role of the manager in engagement as, oh, this is a little bit repetitive, but we'll kind of get into it here. So hire and develop great talent. So again, find those people, but also keep them growing and keep them, um, you know, keep them bought into their role. And that's really that development piece. The manager also actively needs to prioritize engagement. Um, if your leaders are not prioritizing engagement, it's not going to happen because your employees then won't feel like they're, it's important. So we need to, um, we need to make sure they're prioritizing it. Their job is also to align their team's activities and work directly with that mission and vision of the company, of the organization. So, you know, the leader has to now defined the vision and mission and goals, and now the manager's role is to make sure that the work that their employees are doing is aligned with that and is pushing it forward. When it, um, <clears throat> When it comes down to it, humans are emotional creatures. We, um, you know, we like to think that the majority of our employees are making decisions and working based on a rational decision-making process. But studies actually studies actually show that seventy percent of our decisions um, are uh, made on emotional factors as opposed to rational factors. So, um, you know, really the 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 communication and prioritization of engagement is um, is, a, is a huge uh, factor in that as well from, from both the leader and the manager level. Okay, so I'm just gonna, if I don't dry out here. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about burnout as well. <clears throat> and as I said before, this is another one of those buzzwords you're seeing a lot, especially right now. You know, we're in a, uh, you know, we're in a global pandemic, which is, is causing, you know, a lot of stress that people haven't had to deal with previously. A lot of us are working remote. Uh, as you can see, I'm working in my guest room. <laughs> I've been working here for the last eight months. Um, so we, uh, you know, it's, we're dealing with a different situation altogether right now. Um, and what I'm about to talk about is not specific to the pandemic, but definitely good to know when dealing with it and working in this situation. Okay, so first thing we want to talk about is identifying burnout. What does it actually mean and what does it look like? Um, so burnout is 
the feeling of chronic physical, emotional, um, and or other sort of exhaustion. So the body moves into energy conservation mode. So it kind of moves into survival mode when you're in burnout, where it's just trying to keep you keep you going and keep you <laughs> keep you alive. Um, and this is linked to um, too much cortisol, which is a stress hormone. So um, burnout can look like a lot of different things for different people. But what I want to talk about some of the kind of key um, key indicators that we look for uh, when it comes to identifying burnout. Uh, and that's not to say that every person will have all of these. Um, some people might not have any. <laughs> so it's uh, it's something that you you got to look for definitely and, and work to identify, um, but just some kind of key factors here to look for. So chronic exhaustion, if you notice that your employees are just seem tired all the time, uh, you know, persistent, persistent fatigue, they can't get their day going um, and they just kind of feel like they're dragging, um, that can be a, a sign of burnout. A lack of focus, this is this is a huge one. Um, and so one that I think often gets um, overlooked for other things because we can think, oh, we're just busy. Um, but that's not necessarily uh, the case. It can also be an, a symptom of burnout. So shortened, atten shortened attention span, difficulty remembering things. So, you know, things get missed, dates get, get missed, things like that. Um, that can also be a good indicator. Um, physical distress. Now, this might be one that is harder to um, identify from the outside, especially if you're working in a remote uh, environment and you're not actually seeing your employees face to face or, um, you know, in, in, the in, in the same space. Um, but one that, you know, we might want to make, your, make employees aware of um, so that they can identify it in themselves as well. So this could be disturbed sleep, um, back pain, headaches, um, increased heart rate, um, stomach aches, loss of appetite. So anything that's kind of throwing off what their body is doing. Um, and, you know, a lot of sometimes uh, the physical distress comes along with self-medicating as well. So, you know, drinking a lot more coffee, um, use of alcohol, drugs, things like that um, can be a, um, a symptom of or can be a, a, a byproduct of the physical distress caused by burnout. So again, that one's harder to identify uh, externally, but definitely one that we want to keep in mind and make uh, our employees aware of to identify in themselves. Mood instability. This one is very common as well. Um, so if you notice that someone is flying off the handle that doesn't normally do that, uh, chances are there's, you know, you need to have a conversation and that can be a symptom of burnout as well or increase, increasing the irritable or just apathetic to their, to their coworkers when they're not normally like that. So any sort of um, shift or like sudden shift in, in mood, um, excuse me, or demeanor uh, is, is also a symptom of burnout. Um, kind of to go along with that, emotional numbness can uh, can also be a big uh, symptom of burnout. So just they don't care, you know, they're just doing it, they're going along, they don't, you know, they don't have that emotional connection um, and, you know, just a lack of joy in their daily tasks. Loneliness, again, this is one that's harder to identify uh, externally, but um, one that we want to make sure that we're talking about. So, you know, especially in this environment, um, isolation and, uh, you know, loneliness is, is, is a big problem right now when we're all can, kind of sitting in our own little box, just staring at a screen all day. Um, it can be, it can be very, uh, very easy to burn out on that as well. Reduced effectiveness in their role. So if they're just simply not performing, if there's if you've got a high performer that's all of a sudden not performing well, or you know causing problems or things like that, that can be a symptom of burnout. Um, they've just given too much, and they need to um, you know they need a bit of a break. And per pervasive self self doubt, which is hard to say. Um, so the you know questioning themselves, feeling incapable, feeling like an imposter. Again, this one is a little bit harder to. Um, to maybe a little bit harder to identify externally because a lot of people, you know, internalize this. Um, but yeah, again, something definitely to keep in mind. So this is kind of what we're looking for um, when we talk about burnout and what we mean when we talk about burnout. And again, it can look very different in um, in, in different people. So for example, people that are starting to, some people that are, are starting to feel burnt out, sometimes try and work harder and they, they'll take on more um, just because they want to try and counteract that. Um, and again, obviously that's, that's not, <laughs> it doesn't work like that and that's counterintuitive. So um, we just want to make sure that we're aware of these things and, and that our, our all people leaders know what to look for when it comes to burnout um, and make sure that they're not pushing people to the point of burnout and that they know what to look for early on so that they can combat that. Because if you get people that start burning out, 
that's not good for anybody. That's not good for them. It's not good for the organization. You're, you're losing productivity there. Okay, so now what do we do about it? Now that we've identified burnout, um, how do we, wh what do we do? Uh, the, the, the temptation is always just to offer someone time off, right? That's kind of our go-to. And while, you know, that is a, something that we will likely need to do, that's not really um, a solution. That's a band-aid. Uh, we don't, we don't want to just say, okay, go away for a week and come back and just give them and put them back in exactly the same situation. They're just going to get into a cycle of burnout then. They'll come back feeling rested. And, and feeling better, they'll get back into the same situation and just spiral and burn out again. So we really need to be um, <clears throat> identifying the cause of, of burnout and, and, and looking to solve that as well, as well as giving time off. Time off is very important for, for solving burnout, but it's not the only thing. Um, a, a big part of diagnosing the cause of burnout is creating an environment um, where employees feel like they can talk about it and feel like they can talk about anything. We need open communication and we need to communicate often. So employees need to be able to feel like they can communicate what they're feeling, uh, when they're feeling it, without any consequences. So if somebody thinks that they come and they say, I'm really overwhelmed, I don't think I can handle this, if they think their job is on the line because that's the environment they're, they're working in, they're not going to they're not going to tell you that and then they're going to burn out and then they're not going to be effective in their role. Communicate often, especially in a remote work um, environment, is super, super important. Um, we need to be communicating more in a remote work environment because we're not having those one-off, um, you know, coffee maker conversations and lunchroom conversations and things like that. We need to be putting in effort um, as leaders to, uh, to communicate more often. So that's, you know, whether it's weekly one-on-ones, team meetings, check-ins, you know, a coffee chat over Zoom, um, things like that. It's very important for leaders to be communicating with their employees openly and, uh, and often. Okay, so here we got another little buzzword here, our acronym, uh, to help you diagnose the cause of burnout. So once you've identified that somebody is burning out or they're burnt out, we now need to have a conversation with them to really figure out why and what's going on and what's causing it again so we don't get into that burnout spiral so <clears throat> excuse me so here's a little acronym that um helps you identify uh or helps you kind of work through what might be causing the burnout so so it's called where the acronym we're using is camps and i'm actually going to be sharing a link at the end of the presentation to um a, a company in the us called life labs has a burnout diagnostic tool uh that they've shared for free so i have um linked to that as well and it's got step by steps and it walks you through the camps model as well um if you think that someone is burnt out you can use that with them so there there is an additional resource on that and lots more information about camps too but we'll just talk through these different things here and and then again you can kind of look into that uh you can look at that whole diagnostic tool as well so when it comes to certainty in someone's role how satisfied um are you uh and how secure do you feel in your role so if somebody constantly thinks that they're you know they're going to be fired or their role is going to be eliminated or you know that they're uncertain in their role um that can really cause burnout that can be a, a big um a big uh indicator for burnout do they have the resources they need uh to do their work well um you know are they uncertain about their performance um you know if they're not having those performance conversations with their leaders um consistently then and they don't know how they're doing uh then they're going to feel uncertain as to how where they stand in the role Autonomy is another big one. Um, how satisfied uh, is the employee with um, how, how in charge they are of their work? So how, how much ownership do they have of what they're doing, the decisions they're making, um, and things like that? Uh, that's a, that's a, big, um, a, a big thing. A, 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 that kind of ties into that certainty factor as well. Um, so if you feel like you own your work and you're certain of it, then chances are you, you, you feel pretty good about your job. Meaning is another one. Um, do you feel like you're making progress? Do you feel like you're making a difference? Um, you know, do you feel like your contributions are being recognized? If people think that they're just working and working and working and nobody notices how hard they're working or that they're, you know, they're doing a good job and they're never they're never told or they're never communicated with that they're doing well um, or that they are contributing to their team, um, then that that's very becomes very easy for someone to burn out or to become extremely disengaged. Um, progress. So again, kind of tied to, to meaning as well. Like, do you feel like you're moving things forward? Do you feel like you're you're making progress in your um, in your role? Is there anything blocking your work? You know, is that whether that's I don't know 
a tool or a team member or something like that, um, that can also cause burnout too. And social inclusion. So this one is a little bit more outside of the actual day-to-day -day work. And um, how included do you feel on your team? You know, do you, especially again, in this remote work environment, we, we don't get to sit next to our teammates anymore where we maybe talk to them once a day, once a week, depending on what kind of role you're in. Um, you know, if you don't feel included and accepted by your team, uh, you know, chances are you're not gonna be super happy and you're gonna burn out. So once you've kind of gone through this, um, this model or had a conversation like this with someone you think is burning out, <clears throat> excuse me, um, you need to come up with a go forward plan together. So this should never be done independently by the leader. You should not be telling your employees what they need to do to recover from burnout. You should be working with them um, to, again, talk through this, talk through the cause of burnout and help and work with them to diagnose it and then also work with them to come up with an, a plan to fix it um, because you, you know, you don't know necessarily exactly what they think they need um, and they might not know what they think they what they need so working together um, is definitely a huge benefit there and you know so there's a couple things that you can do here so time off is really helpful um, changes in their roles and duties so whether that's permanent or temporary you know if they think okay i'm super overwhelmed by everything going on in the world right now um, i think i need to roll it back a little bit um, on certain things and then, you know, try again in a couple months. That can be a temporary change or permanent, whether they, you know, maybe they want a whole new role and that's, you know, that's, that's part of the solution and you can work with them to help get there. Increased communication. Uh, communication is going to be a huge theme throughout this whole, uh, our whole discussion today. Um, we, we really want to make sure that we're, we're, um, we're communicating a lot um, and that's going to be a big factor in engagement and burnout. Providing careful and thoughtful feedback. So that's, you know, making sure that you're telling people how they're doing in their role and making sure that it's productive feedback as well and not penalizing. Uh, also, uh, something I want to point out that's very important when it comes to burnout, um, providing additional resources. So, um, you know, if somebody is really struggling with their mental health, um, you know, a, a people leader or, or their manager might not be the right person to deal with that. So we need to be able to provide additional resources for that employee to get help and not try and solve it on our own. Uh, so that's a, that's a big one as well. Okay, so now that we've kind of talked about the heavy stuff when it comes to burnout, we're going to talk get a little bit lighter and talk about the importance of um, an engaged uh, workplace, workplace and or workforce. Sorry, and uh, and why do we care about all this that we're talking about today? So why is it important? Engaged employees. Um, are, are more productive kind of it's pretty simple <laughs> so if they want to be there they're engaged in their work they're more productive uh, that also comes uh, along with increased quality of work um, you know they're going to do better work when they're when they're engaged and they believe in what they're doing uh, increased customer satisfaction. Now, customer. When I talk about customer, it doesn't necessarily mean someone who's purchasing a product or th something like that. That could be internal customers they work with. Um, that can be, um, you know, a, a recipients of, of an organization's charity. Things like that. Um, that that's what I mean when I say customer. There. Decrease in employee turnover. Um, so uh, engaged employees, happy employees, they stay, um, and that's that's what we want. Better overall employee health. Employee health is uh, is important um, because employees that are not healthy need more time off. They are, you know, a little bit more dream and benefits and things like that. So we want our employees to be happy and healthy. And, uh, and excuse me, <clears throat> engaged employees uh, come to work more often. So there's a lower absenteeism if that's uh, an issue you're facing. Um, you know, it, focusing on employee engagement can help with that as well. It enhances company culture. Um, engagement is contagious. Uh, people like working with people that other people that are engaged, so they're going to want to strive for that. And really, when it comes down to it, disengaged employees are expensive. Uh, so Gallup research shows that employee disengagement costs the United States upwards of $550 billion a year in lost productivity. And again, I apologize for the American statistics, but those there's a lot more of them. It was harder to find Canadian statistics. But that just gives you um, an idea of really, um, you know, the, the magnitude that we're talking about when it comes to lost productivity due to disengaged employees. Okay, so now that we know what engagement is, why it's important, and what we're looking for uh, in disengaged employees and burnt out employees, how do we measure that, and, and how do we kind of get started? So I'm going to talk about a couple, um, a couple strategies around uh, ways to measure employee engagement. 
There's a lot of different things you can do here. I'm focusing on two. I'm going to focus on surveys and stay interviews. Um, again, there's lots more different things you can do, but the reason I'm focusing on these two is because you can do them uh, quickly, you can do them easily, and you can do them for the most part for free. Um, so with your existing resources that you've got. It, so I wanted to focus on those because they're kind of the easiest to, to implement um, and easiest to kind of get you off the ground when it comes to measuring employee engagement. Okay, surveys. So engagement surveys often get a bad rap. Um, you know, you can do a full employee engagement survey, have a consultant come in, cost you tens of thousands of dollars. They have all these questions, they give you all this data and they analyze it. That can be really, really helpful if you're in a, you know, BlackBerry size organization or, you know, open text or something like that. They might want something of that magnitude. But for smaller organizations, uh, for example, the company I work for, we're under 200 people, so we don't have the capacity to take that a, a project of that magnitude on. But we do surveys internally still. So you can do them simply and you can do them easily and you can do them at a very uh, little to no cost. So the good thing about uh, surveys is what's the easiest way to find out how engaged your employees are? You ask them. Um, and, you know, the way you ask them is important and what you ask them is important, but ask them. And, you know, chances are you'll get more feedback than you think. Surveys, um, they give employee a voice and they help build trust. If people, you know, you're creating that um, environment of feedback and that environment of trust, um, if they feel like they, you know, they have input into how things are going, they're going to be more engaged. You can, get, you can gather feedback um, that can direct uh, that can help direct company uh, level growth. So help kind of guide that mission and vision that we talked about, or see where you're way off the rails with it as well. Um, you can also see gaps in where your employees think you are versus where you think you are when it comes to the mission and vision, and, and identify those and solve them. Uh, you can solve problems before they worsen. So employees might share feedback on things that you had no idea were an issue, was an issue uh, in a survey. Um, and, uh, and, and that's great because that means you can kind of cut it off at the pass. Increased transparency, that's a huge thing. You know, employees want to feel like they know what's going on. They don't want to feel like they're being kept in the dark. Um, so surveys help with that because, you know, once you do, we'll talk about a little bit in a minute, but once you do your survey and you gather the results, you're going to share those back with that, that back with your employees and it's going to give them a view into um, how the organization is doing and the feedback has been given. Surveys also allow you to easily track themes over time. And that's really important because if you are constantly seeing, um, excuse me, if you're constantly seeing an answer that people say that, you know, the communication isn't clear or we want more um, communication from upper leadership and you see that in several surveys, then, you know, that means that that's definitely a, a pillar that you should be focused on. And it creates that culture of feedback, um, which is really something we want um, because it feel, if employees feel that they can give feedback, they're also more likely to take feedback um, a little bit better as well. So some quick survey tips here. Um, I've done quite a few um, surveys uh, and this is just some stuff that I have uh, picked up over time but kept it super simple. Anonymity is key. If people feel like their job is on the line based on the feedback they give, they will not give you feedback. So keep it anonymous. Um, it'll, it's still just as effective if you don't know who it's coming from. It also gives, it really empowers employees to give, give honest feedback as well, which is what we want. You need to use the results. Gathering the data is one thing, doing something with it is another. So really you do need to um, you know, pull out those general themes that you find um, in the data that you've gathered and create an action plan going forward. What are you gonna do with it and how, what's it gonna look like um, but, but for the next six months, year, et cetera, and communicate that action plan. So you need to be telling your employees, we've heard you, this is what we heard, and this is what we're gonna do about it. Um, and that communication is really key in keeping people involved and bought into, the, uh, bought into the survey as well as bought into giving feedback. So it's really important there as well. And again, you don't need to be sharing, um, you know, all the nitty gritty details, high level themes, um, and then actionable uh, feedback is all you need to share as well. All right, so I'm going to talk about two survey methods. Um, these, the reason I picked these two is again, they're quick, they're easy, and they can be both, and they can both be done. Um, for free. Uh, you don't need a special tool to, to do these. There's lots of tools that do surveys. They're very expensive um, and they can be really helpful if you have the budget for that. Um, however, if you don't, you can, you can still do them. So the employee net promoter score um, is uh, actually the survey technique that we use at AVIC um, and I really like it. It's, it's super simple. So it's only two questions. Your employees are asked to 
um, to rate their uh, likelihood to recommend your organization as an employer uh, on a scale of one to 10. So this actually, if it, some of you might be familiar with a net promoter score that's sent out to customers, it's the same, uh, same concept, but it's done internally with employees. So how likely would they be to recommend your organization um, as an employer? And then there's an open feedback box that follows that saying, what could we do to make your experience better? Or, you know, what are we doing well? You can include both of those questions as well. Um, so it's super easy, super quick for people to answer. Um, you know, some of the, the one of the reasons that surveys often get a bad rap is because people don't want to take the time to fill them out. All you're asking here is two questions. The results are also very easy to interpret. You get a score. So um, you come when it comes to uh, to the EMPS score, it's on a scale from negative 100 to positive 100. And you can see my little graphic here that I, I use in every EMPS presentation I do. Um, so your um, your zero to hold on, let me just check my numbers here. But you've got detractors, neutral. And, uh, and promoters. So your promoters are people that are like, yes, I'm going to recommend you as, a, as an employer. Um, you know, I would love to con continue working here. You're doing a great job. So those are your nines and tens. Your sevens and eights are your neutral. They're like, yeah, you're doing a good job, but there's some stuff we could improve. You know, I'm okay. And then your um, zero to what did I say? Sorry, <laughs> zero to six. Those are your detractors. So those are your people that are not going to be recommending uh, your organization and they can be actively pulling away uh, from or, or disengaging. Um, so that's kind of, that's where you're at. And that's how your score is calculated. So the number of detractors is, uh, is uh, subtracted from the number of uh, promoters and that's how you get that score on the negative 100 to positive 100 scale. So um, just to kind of give you a quick anecdote here, anything above zero is considered a good score. <laughs> so it's kind of hard when you have a scale that big and you see like, oh, we only have a score of 30 or whatever, that's still a good score. Anything above 50 is considered exceptional. So again, uh, ENPS is super easy to, um, to administer. It's a, you know, you get an easy number score. So that's a great, you know, a great visual and a great um, way to share with your employees how you're doing, as long as you explain to them the context of how you got that number. And it allows for open-ended feedback. So it's just that open comment box saying, what can we do better? Or what can we do better? And what, what do you enjoy about working here? The only drawback of the NPS here is that it does not allow for asking specific questions. So if you really want to drill down on a couple of things, um, ENPS is not going to be the, the, the uh, form that you would take, uh, the survey method that you would use, uh, just because it's kind of more of those open-ended questions. If you've never done a survey before, ENPS is a really good option for that uh, as, a, as a kind of a starting point. And it also, uh, if you do it over time, every six months, every year, things like that, um, you can see a clear progression or hopefully progression in your numbers there as well. The other uh, survey <clears throat> methodology I wanna talk about is the Gallup Q12 survey. Um, so it consists of 12 uh, specific questions, actionable workplace elements that um, offer proven links to performance outcomes. Um, so Gallup uh, is an organization that does a ton of research around uh, employment and, um, and employee uh, engagement and happiness and things like that. So they've done a lot of research to come up with these specific 12 questions um, and, uh, and, the, and, what, and there's also explanation as to what each of those questions indicates. So, um, so for this one, you're answering, each question is answered on a scale of one to five or you can do it on like strongly disagree to strongly agree, things like that. And you get numbers based results. So, you know, you can see that how many people um, rated a, a, a five for, um, you know, I feel appreciated in the workplace and, and, and that'll give you good indicators there. Again, it's, it's not super long. It's only 12 questions and it's, it's uh, just selecting numbers. So it's a multiple choice, super quick to fill out. The uh, drawback on the Gallup uh, survey is that it does not allow for open-ended feedback. Now that being said, you can always add a comment box at the bottom as well, um, but, um, but it's, it's designed to just be those 12 questions. So I have um, provided resources on both of these in the, the links uh, at the end of this presentation. So um, I have a link that, that links to um, what the Gallup 12 questions are and what each of them means and what's it's supposed to indicate, um, as well as how to administer an EMPS uh, survey. Both of these can be done, as I said, very easily. 
you can do them through a Google form. You can do them through SurveyMonkey. Um, both of those are, have free options. Um, so if you're worried about cost, you can do both of these surveys um, through through those uh, those platforms, and um, you can get results that are easy to look at and easy to um, analyze as well. I want to be conscious of time here. I realize I'm I'm chatting more than I thought I was going to. So. Um, the other tip that um, I wanted to talk about when it comes to measuring, or the other method I want to talk about when it comes to measuring engagement, uh, is stay interviews, which is kind of an odd concept uh, that not a lot of, of people have encountered. But um, a, a stay interview is essentially asking your current employees why they continue to work for your organization and, and what, they, um, you know, what they want and what they see uh, going forward in their role. So we want to make sure that we are dedicating uh, time to ask standard structured questions, but in a casual conversational manner. It shouldn't feel like a trial. It shouldn't feel like a, a performance review. It's totally different than that. Um, this can provide insight about what the organization can do to improve and, and how um, and how your your employees uh, and how sorry how to retain your valued employees. It also builds trust, it's, again, building that what, the culture of feedback that we talked about before. Um, and it can be preferable to surveys uh, because it provides uh, two-way conversation. So it, it's it's a leader talking to the, or sorry, a manager a leader talking to an employee and, and asking them questions. It asks, allows for follow-up questions um, and more of a discussion. Um, now that being said, it does not have to be one or the other. You can do stay interviews and surveys. You can do a whole bunch of different things in combination with each other. Some quick tips for stay interviews. Uh, approach is important. Um, again, like I said, it should not feel like a trial. It should not feel like a performance review. It's a whole other ball game. So we, we want to make sure that it's a conversation, um, but that the employee knows the purpose of the conversation as well. You want to ask meaningful questions. Um, why you, what keeps you working here? How do you like to be recognized? Um, what can we do to support you better? What do you like most about your job? Do you feel underutilized in certain uh, aspects of your job? Lots of different questions you can ask here, but they're very pointed um, and they're, you know, they have very specific uh, uh, goals. You want to commit to positive change. So, um, you know, you shouldn't just have the conversation and then run off and never talk about it again. Uh, you need to tell your employees what you're going to do and how you're going to use their feedback um, and based on the same interview and then follow up with them uh, to talk about that change and how, how, it's, how it's going so far. So far. And a big point here is you want to listen more than you talk. This is your employee's opportunity to share their feedback on their role. So it should be, the stage should be theirs. Again, in the, the resource section at the end there, I've provided a, um, a resource as to how, to how to perform a stay interview and what some of the questions uh, you should be asking in a stay interview. Okay, getting started with engagement. So now that we've talked about all these things and these different um, strategies and things like things you can do, where do you start? And, and how do you get going now that you've identified this as a pillar you want to focus on? So just remember when it comes to employee engagement, this is a marathon, not a sprint. There is no finish line. It's a continuous thing. You wanna be talking about engagement uh, as a long-term continued effort within your organization. There isn't a tick box to check and oh yeah, employee engagement's done. It's, a, it's an ongoing thing. Engagement starts with leaders. Uh, if leaders are committed and engaged, uh, your employees are more likely to be as well. You also want to define your engaged purpose. Um, so that's, again, we talked about the mission and purpose and values. You want to make sure that those are clearly defined so that people know what they're working towards and, you know, what they're working for. An understanding, uh, sorry, an understanding of simple engagement principles, which is a lot of kind of what we talked about today. So that purpose, the transparency, action, commitment, things like that. Um, you need to have a good understanding of those and measure uh, engagement on an ongoing basis. So using those, some of those measurement tools we talked about, um, it, it's a good way to kind of keep talking, keep the conversation going about engagement. Uh, personally, I think six month surveys are a really good way to do it. So for example, um, at the organization I work at at AVIC, we do an ENPS um, survey every six months. Um, we also do stay interviews, um, usually once a year with all employees as well. Um, so you can use those things in combination, but it's got to be um, consistent and it's got to be regular and structured. All right, one step at a time. We got to make sure that everyone's in the right role. Um, if you have people leaders that are, should not be people leaders, your engagement is going to suffer. Uh, you know, that's a pretty, I think we've all experienced uh, things like that. So that's going to be uh, a big focus. 
Um, you need to provide uh, proper training. So you need to make sure that your managers, your leaders, um, and your employees are uh, feeling like they're growing in, in their roles and feel like they know what it means to be engaged and how, the, how they do that. Uh, task meaningful work. So engaged employees want to feel like they're making a difference. They want to feel like they're contributing, that they're, you know, moving the, the needle forward in their role. So, um, and again, the stay interview can be a really good way to figure out what this means for each employee. Check in often. I'm going to be a broken record on this. You got to keep communicating and you got to keep that communication open um, and, uh, and, and check in with all your employees, whether that's at the, the manager level or the employee level as well. And discuss engagement frequently. Um, like I said, this is a continued thing. We got to keep talking about it um, and, uh, and, and make it part of your company culture um, in order to keep it going. It can't be forced. Um, you know, your, your people have got to want to be, want, want, got to want to be there and got to have be, got to be bought into uh, to your mission and, and values. Okay, here are just a couple engagement trends. I'll take two minutes to talk about these and then we've got a couple minutes for questions. Um, so non-monetary perks and benefits are becoming increasingly um, important. Employees don't just want a job and a paycheck anymore. Um, they want an experience and they want to enjoy where they work. Time away, away from work can be just as important as time working. So whether that's social time with their peers, volunteering, uh, support for parental leave, support for um, other types of leaves, things like that, that can be a huge benefit and flexibility in their work environment, whether that's where they work, when they work, things like that, that'll really help uh, when it comes to engagement because it also um, fosters trust. Uh, you know, so you don't have someone looking over your shoulder all the time and you're trusted to work when you want, that's, that's a huge empowering factor. An agile work environment. Now, this is something that, you know, we could probably have a whole presentation just on what an agile work environment uh, means, but I've only got nine minutes of your time left. Um, so I've provided a resource on exactly what that means and what it looks like. Um, but I've got a little note here that says, get rid of forever-itis. Uh, this is a term that I picked up when working with a volunteer group when I was in university, and I used, have used it ever since. Saying, well, we've always done it that way is not going to, uh, you know, that's not a good thing. We want to get that out of our vocabulary. And adjust your physical work environment to be a little bit more agile for, uh, for your employees. Again, I've provided a big resource on what an agile work environment looks like. Um, employees want to make a difference. They want to see what they're doing and they expect uh, corporate responsibility as well. So this can be a little bit easier if you're working in a not-for-profit or a charitable organization because the difference you're making can be seen, uh, is easier to explain to your employees and they can see what they're doing. Um, but when it comes to corporate responsibility, um, that's for all of us to do. You know, we want to make sure that we are making the world a better place in everything that we do. And corporate responsibility programs don't have to be complicated or uh, convoluted or anything like that. This could be as simple as going paperless, we're saving trees, uh, you know, we're being better for the environment um, and things like that. So, uh, or volunteer days, uh, things like that as well, where you give your employees the opportunity to do some good in their jobs too. Organizational culture is king. Um, we we want to work somewhere where we feel uh, happy, we feel included, and we, uh, we like going every day. Um, so you want to feel at home when you're at work, which is kind of ironic given, given that a lot of us are working from home lately. You need to put your employees first. Um, you know, we, there's a lot of this talk about like the inverted pyramid of, um, of priorities in an organization. So a lot of people put, you know, profits or shareholders um, and customers and everything first. That's actually backwards. We need to be putting our employees first and then customers and then our shareholders um, because happy employees, engaged employees will lead to better profits, happier customers and everything uh, from there down. So the, putting employees first and really focusing on them is a huge, huge thing. Employees want a voice. Um, you know, it, having that culture of feedback and culture of communication is uh, is hugely beneficial when it comes to engaged employees. Um, and it's really, it, it's not a hard thing to do. You know, it, like I said, it starts from the top down. If your leaders are open to, uh, or if your leaders provide open communication, then your employees will feel that they can do the same as well. And they can feel like they're contributing uh, when they provide feedback. Okay. We've got a couple minutes left here. I know that was a lot of information, um, but like I said, I've provided some additional resources and I'm happy to chat with anybody uh, to, as a follow-up as well. So Taryn, do we have any questions? We have a couple. Okay. Uh, one that came in 
is can you give some examples on how employees can effectively approach their manager around their own burnout? Ah, that's a really good question, actually. Um, I think that kind of starts with we want to make sure um, from a leader perspective, and again, I, I don't know what our audience looks like today as a makeup of leaders versus individual contributors, but we wanna make sure that our leaders understand what burnout is. So an employee, if an employee comes to a leader and says, I'm feeling burnt out or I'm feeling overwhelmed, it doesn't get written off. Um, so it really mm -hmm. comes from uh, under, making sure that our leaders understand how serious burnout is and what it is. Um, so that's kind of the starting point. From an employee perspective, I think that being honest is, is the key, is the, the biggest key there. Um, mm -hmm. Saying, you know, I'm feeling overwhelmed or, um, you know, this might be, I'm, I'm over capacity right now. Um, can I get, can I, you know, have more time on this or can I um, give this back or have somebody else work on this? Um, and just kind of using that language um, can be, can be really helpful in helping to communicate if you're not comfortable going and saying, I think I'm burnt out, I need a day or I need a week or whatever it is, because that can be a hard thing to say as well. So, you know, come, you know, using that language of I'm feeling overwhelmed, I'm over capacity, um, I need help on certain things or I could, I could use some support. Um, that language is really good uh, coming from the employee side. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, I was wondering as well, kind of on a lighter note, uh, I've seen on social media that Avik does some neat employee engagement programs, uh, something around Lego. Uh, can you talk about a couple that have, uh, yes, were, are working I for you? Thank you, actually. Um, so this is my Lego guy. <laughs> um, so everybody at Avik, uh, when they start, um, gets a little Lego person. Um, and with the Avik Networks block there, and you'll notice that I have a block for every year of service. Um, so it's just a fun way to recognize employees um, when it comes to tenure and when it comes to other accomplishments as well. So there's tons yes. of different blocks out there. So um, we held, for example, we hosted a really big event last January and anyone who was involved in that and planning, executing, they got a block that with the name of the event on it. So it's just a really easy um, way to recognize people that uh, is really, really appreciated. So uh, it's, it's, it's fun and everybody seems to enjoy it. Nice. Are there any other uh, engagement kind of styles or things that you do over the course of the year that might be good yes. to share? So, um, so as I said, we do we do the employee net promoter score survey every six months. We're actually mm -hmm. in the survey period right now. Uh -huh. um, we do stay interviews. We try and do them once or twice a year with every employee, and that's the employee's direct manager does that or direct okay. leader. Does that. Um, that does not come from HR, that comes from, from within their team. Those are big, uh, big strategies we use. Um, we also do uh, Ask Me Anything or town, town hall style company-wide meetings with our leadership once a quarter. Um, so we ask people to submit questions um, and uh, ahead of time or during the, the AMA, um, and it can be on anything at all. Sometimes it's company related, sometimes it's, you know, what's your favorite music genre, things like that, just a way to get to know the leaders um, and really kind of humanize them in a way um, and get, allow people to ask for feedback and ask questions and challenge them on things as well. Um, we also do quarterly business reviews. So our CEO every quarter uh, does a presentation to the entire company that's really kind of like a state of the union type um, a type presentation so we can see exactly what's happening with um, sales, profits, um, problems that are happening, the product direction, things like that. Um, and that really helps to keep people engaged, that level of transparency. Fantastic. That is excellent. I think those might be all of our questions. We just had a couple come in. Uh, but if folks want to reach out to Taylor, she will be sharing her contact information or you can reach out to me at info at svpwr.org and I can put the two of you into contact. Uh, with that said, uh, Taylor, thank you so much for leading this session. Uh, I know there's a few things that I learned today. Uh, definitely the stay interviews uh, that I'd like to sort of bring into SVP's own kind of day-to-day -day life. Uh, again, I will be sharing recording and slides early next week, uh, but if folks have questions or feedback in the meanwhile or ideas for future workshops, uh, you can reach out to me at info at svpwr.org. Thank you as well to BDO Canada for being our workshop sponsor. Uh, your support really does make so much possible. And thank you everyone here for joining us. Until we meet again, take care and be good to each other.